Welcome to Prestasia Conversations. I'm your host, Noah Berlatsky, and this week we're talking to um, a couple other people here at Prestasia. That's Executive Director Jeremy Malcolm and Program Director Megan Ingerman. And um, we're having them here today because uh, this month, towards the beginning of the month of September, there was a huge social media firestorm around Prestasia, uh, which is not the first time that's happened, but we thought it was it was particularly harsh this time, so we wanted to talk about some issues raised by that and about why this keeps why this is something that is sort of part of what happens when you do this kind of work. So I guess that's that's the first question really is why why does sort of trying to do um, work around child sexual assault in this way um, result in so much controversy and in these kind of repeated attacks, which are often just sort of like straight out slanders? Um, so yeah, I think the first most obvious answer is fear. A lot of people, there's a lot of fear around this subject. And so people approach it with fear. And if you're approaching from that angle, you don't have an open mind. You're not interested in learning more about the subject. You're just taking what you have read or what you have heard, and you're taking that at like face value. And this is a really nuanced subject that really requires a lot more thought to be put into it. It's not just a because we really like to look at these as like a boogeyman or like there's a really obvious bad guy and there's a snidely whiplash with the the mustache and it's just obvious who we're against and it's just not like that. There's no like physical profile to look for. Um, and so people really approach with a lot of fear because they don't know, they don't understand. And like that's a really bad place to start from. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it would be comforting if there was like a black and white divide between, you know, here are the pedophiles, these are the people we need to worry about, and everyone else is safe. And unfortunately, it's not that way. Um, as Megan said, like, there is no profile um, of someone who commits child sexual abuse. The majority of people who do don't have pedophilia. Um, and uh, so um, the approach that we've taken, we knew that it would be controversial from the outset, um, but... Like, we can't really do anything but go where the experts tell us because um, only by doing that we can sort of avoid some of these pitfalls of, you know, putting resources into the wrong areas, you know, worrying about the wrong things and failing to worry about the things that we, we should be. So um, I guess it's going to keep happening until society can learn, until we can get that message out broadly enough that people, you know, will twig and say, you know what, I actually don't think that, um, you know, these stereotypes about sex trafficking and pedophilia are true. And um, I think that's going to take a while longer until that really disseminates uh, as widely as it needs to, to stop these sort of knee-jerk attacks. I would also say just like right on its face, sex, neg sex negativity has a lot to do with this. Because if you're also starting from a sex negative point, you're not open to learning anything more about just the various spectrums that sex involves. Yeah, I mean, that, that is one of the reasons why the stigma spreads so far, right? Because this isn't just a stigma against um, people who have pedophilia. It's a stigma that spreads towards many different groups in society that are, you know, um, are painted with that same brush. You know, if you're into kinky sex, if you're, um, you know, if you're a, a sex worker, if you're, um, you know, if you're queer, uh, a lot of the time, then people will attack you by using the same rhetoric that they use uh, against people who are assumed to be uh, child sex abusers. And um, so that's really one of the main reasons why prostasia came together in the first place because we saw the damage that was being done to diverse communities by this sort of harmful fear-based rhetoric that Megan was talking about. And, um, and so um, I, I feel like that's why we have a pretty broad base of supporters from all of those communities because they're the ones who are damaged by this rhetoric and, um, and taking a more evidence-based approach 
will actually be beneficial um, to a broad number of groups in society. So that's, I mean, I, I guess I was going to maybe add to that. I mean, you're kind of talking about sort of like how there's a lot of fear and um, sort of good faith concern. But I mean, I think there's, there's also just people who, I mean, at least, you know, I mean, some in some instances, some of the sort of most disturbing attacks were from the far right, you know. And so I, th I think that there's also just people who... Um, I, I guess, as Megan were saying, were, are actually kind of just sex negative and sort of want to, you know, really kind of want to hurt marginalized people. And so the idea that there would be um, a reduction of stigma against or that or, or really that, you know, that there might be some sort of like questioning of the sort of like way that we think about child sexual abuse as sort of from outsiders rather than something that is a problem within many traditional families or in the ways that we think about traditional families. You know, people are really, there are people who are just, you know, opposed to that idea on its face and kind of want to crush anyone who says that. So I think there's kind of a mix of sort of like, just some good faith concerns and then, you know, but also a lot of like really inflammatory bad faith attacks, which, you know, make it much more difficult to respond to good faith concerns or to have a conversation that and isn't. Are, yeah. Go ahead. Those are the ones that come out in numbers. Those are the ones who show up and pile on and have terrible things to say. Like, I agree with you. A lot of the worst attacks come from that side. And sometimes they're just really, like, the things that they're willing to say and thinking about, it's frightening. I mean, it serves a purpose. It does fuel bigotry. And this is why we see alt-right uh, communities latching onto this issue. You know, this is why QAnon latched onto this issue. Um, because it, it is fuel for their sort of broader campaign of bigotry against minorities. Um, and unfortunately, the messages that they put out there um, then get picked up by people who are maybe more moderate mm -hmm. um, and who are just risk averse and who, who just because of the sensitivity of this area and because everyone, you know, almost everyone really does care about protecting children, they don't want to, they don't want to mess around if there's, you know, if these allegations are out there, then maybe they're true, you know, and, uh, and so that's how you get, you know, more progressive voices actually repeating some of the misinformation that's come from the alt-right uh, sphere. Yeah, and I think people sometimes don't realize how how much the sort of bad actors influence sort of their thinking and the conversation. I mean, both in the sense that you know it becomes really polarizing. So, like any question becomes this kind of evidence of evil doing, um, and in the sense that you know, I mean, it just becomes really difficult to like, you know, if you're like worried that like far right people are going to like send you death threats or dox you if you say anything right i mean it just becomes really difficult to sort of like engage with good faith you know criticism at all because you can't say anything because you're kind of like you know you just can't speak publicly when you're under that kind of fire is my kind of experience i mean that's that's a lesson that i've failed to learn a few times when I've tried to engage with these trolls and usually made things worse. Um, but I need to, I need to heed that lesson for sure. Right. Well, it's hard too, because then if you don't say anything, it's also used as, you know, oh, well, they're, they're afraid to speak in public. And like, yeah, I'm kind of afraid because like, you know, yeah, these far, well, these far right networks are like, you know, sort of threatening my family. So that, that makes it difficult to sort of like speak in public about it. Um, so I guess, I guess kind of the, I mean, the, I think the sort of like the big sort of question around prestasia that people are concerned about or the, you know, that comes out is like, is just like, why do we work with maps or pedophiles? Like this is a community that a lot of people see as inherently dangerous or, you know, a threat to children. And so the question is like, 
why is it important to, you know, sort of like engage with research about them or to even, you know, to, to, to try to, to work with that community at all? I mean, for me, it just seems really obvious that if you're trying to keep something from happening, you would talk to the people who are most likely to make it happen and find out what they need to not do that. Like for me, like right on its face, that seems really obvious. But I also came from a place of that not being obvious. And so I get some of the fear. I get some of the misinformation and the the sort of uh, assumptions people make based on like their feelings. And that's the thing, like the knee jerk emotional reaction is a big part of this. Um, but I mean, as far as prevention goes, if you want to take a holistic approach, which is what you have to do, any systemic problem like this requires looking at all angles, you also have to look at maps. You have to look at the research being done about them. You have to look at the lived experiences they're offering and what has worked in not offending. You have to take all of these angles into consideration in order to bring about a real solution to something. I think another point is that even though the majority of sexual offending against children isn't by people who are minor attracted, um, nevertheless, if you, it, it's harder to reach the communities um, that are opportunistic offenders because they're not the ones who will come forward for help. Whereas if there's someone who realises that, oh, my God, I'm attracted to children, they're more likely to actually come forward and seek out support um, and so that's one of the reasons why the research community and the clinicians um, do try and, uh, and, and work with MAPS specifically because there's the most chance of doing some good there. And another reason why Prostasia sort of supports them in doing that is because that work is the most stigmatised in this field. So, like, there's plenty of money you know, for, you know, anti-sex trafficking cam information campaigns and, um, and you know, criminal justice interventions and, you know, um, inserting spyware into, into technical tools to try and uh, detect abuse online. There's so much money going towards all of that and nothing, virtually nothing, like a trickle of funding going towards working with this stigmatised community. And so it really shouldn't fall to Prostasia Foundation to be funding basic scientific research in this field. And yet it does. Like, we've contributed more than $50,000 of research money um, into child sexual abuse prevention this year alone. And if you know the size of our budget and how little our staff are working for, like, that's an enormous amount. And it's just shameful in a way that stigma requires um, experts to... Um, to, to do their work on a shoestring, to, it, it, to have to defend themselves against trolls online. And, and this really does scare a lot of people away from this work, funders and researchers and clinicians and activists alike. Because why do this if it's going to be that hard? It's a really hard sell at this point. So one of the things that came up, I mean, the sort of nature of a moral panic is that there are sort of like infinite accusations which are, you know, and some of which are true. So, I mean, they're not true, but some of which are like, you know, based on something vaguely resembling, you know, something that we're actually engaged in and our misunderstandings. And then some of which are just, you know, complete lies. And it's difficult to like, you know, it's kind of impossible to respond to all of them. Um, but, you know, one of the things that people were especially concerned about was the MAP support group that Prestasia works with. And especially with the fact that some that the group is open in some capacity to to younger people because pedophilia, you know, people start to recognize that they're pedophiles when they're adolescents. Um, so, could you talk about like why we work with that group and sort of what what kind of safeguards are in place? It's it's a uh, peer support chat group um, and. Uh, it's there because um, experts have told us that having um, social supports, such as peer support, um, reduces the risk that people will go into an emotionally bad space where they're more at risk of offending. Um, so what we've done to support the group is um, 
it, it already had, when we came in, it had very strict policies. You're not allowed to talk about children in a sexualized way. You're not allowed to uh, post photos of them. Um, and we've backed that up with some additional safeguards. So, for example, scanning all images to make sure that there's no child abuse images, um, making sure that uh, minors uh, and adults can't direct message each other, um, reviewing messages to, making, to, to make sure that there's no uh, funny business going on. And most importantly, perhaps, um, our partnership that we established with Stop It Now, um, which is another charity um, that works on abuse prevention, uh, having their trained helpline operators to be in the forum um, to provide a gateway to professional support, which, of course, is very important as um, uh, and very inaccessible to a lot of people who, who have this problem because um, uh, not many professionals want to deal with this population. Uh, some of those who do uh, will report them uh, to CPS even in the absence of them acting on their desires in any way. Um, and, and as you sort of alluded to, um, the reason why minors, uh, adolescents are included is because not only do most people start to realise their sexual attraction towards younger children when they are in their own adolescence, but also, if you look at um, the most common age for sexual offending against a child, it's normally committed by someone who is as young as 14 years of age. So if we don't serve that population, then there's a huge potential that uh, young people will fall into these um, bad patterns of offending before they've had the opportunity to receive any help. I think also another thing that we hear a lot is that we don't support therapy for MAPS. And I feel like MSC is a really good example of like, no, we do actually support professional help, not to mention we have our own Get Help page that has therapy resources, uh, free options, um, various options for like sliding scale, that kind of thing. And so the whole MSC mess and that we really just want to put maps in a place where they can do whatever they want is just so beyond the pale to me because we put so much work into putting resources out there. We also raise money to provide professional support for free as well. We've got a fundraising campaign um, so that if you want to get a professional therapist and you can't find one um, or can't afford one, then we can help out with that. So is the, is the criticism that we're not that Prestasia is not supporting um, conversion therapy? Is that the issue? I mean, because I know that sometimes people think that you can... People would like, I mean, including, I think, many maps themselves would like there to be a cure so that they were no longer attracted to children. And But, I mean, there hasn't... There isn't really any evidence that there is anything that does that unfortunately, as far as we know, right? I mean, that's not the therapy that you need to be supporting because it doesn't really work. Um, so I think it's twofold. There are definitely people, like bad actors, who are just saying that we don't believe in therapy. We don't think MAPS should get therapy. We don't believe in... Uh, because we're afraid of mandated reporter, reporting and that kind of thing. And we're not afraid of that in the, like, don't go to therapy because that might happen sort of way. We're very much for, like, how about more trained professionals who know how to do this so that it's not just an instant mandated reporting situation where there was nothing to report. Um, but definitely also the fact that we don't believe in conversion therapy comes up because a lot of people say get therapy or get help, and what they mean is get cured. And as you said, as far as we know, as far as science says right now, there's no cure. Um, and so definitely when we say things like that's not what therapy for MAPS means, because therapy for MAPS means largely helping them to accept who they are and live the healthiest lifestyle possible with that, you know, how to deal with the thoughts in their head, how to deal with the societal stigma, that kind of thing. And so like, it's definitely both sides of it where we get people saying you don't believe in therapy when the reality is we believe in a lot more therapy from trained professionals. And the idea that that is being pro-pedophilia is just nonsense. I mean, uh, it's really a question of 
let's do what works. And what works is to help people to um, to control their own behaviours rather than trying to control what goes on in their heads. The other thing about trying to control what goes on in people's heads is that, again, it affects a whole lot of other communities because if you can control what goes on in some people's heads, maybe you can stop trans people from being trans. You know, maybe you can stop... Um, people, you know, kinky people from being into whatever kinky sex they're into, you know. Um, and so thought control is just, it, it, it's strange that I even need to say this, but <laughs> not, only, not only is thought control impossible in the way that a lot of people would like it to be, but it's also really harmful to try, yeah. you know. Criminalising people over their thoughts is you just don't want to go there, you know. Well, I mean, and this is kind of one of, I mean, this is another thing that people brought up, I think, is that, you know, the concern that the social justice commitments to, you know, um, sex workers' rights or to the rights of people in the kink community or to trans rights or to queer rights, that those are just some sort of, um, you know, they're just kind of a cover for, you know, trying to normalize maps or the advocacy around maps issues. So, um, but the truth is that that's weaponized against other communities all the time. I mean, you know, you know, um, uh, queer people are always called child sexual abusers. Um, you know, sex workers are constantly you know, I mean, I mean, that's kind of why First Asia does so much around, you know, sex worker rights is because sex workers are constantly being blamed for child sexual abuse. Um, and trans people, you know, I mean, like, like being trans is like currently sort of like one of the main ways of attacking trans people is by claiming that they're corrupting youth or that, you know, a child transitioning is effectively, you know, child sexual abuse. So, um, it's just, you know, it's especially disturbing to see people who you would hope would understand that the, you know, feeling like yeah. you can somehow, you know, separate these issues when I just don't, don't see how that's going to, you know, it's also anti-Semitism. I mean, cause that's something I've gotten a lot of like in this particular social media firestorm is, you know, not especially, um, you know, hidden anti-Semitism directed at me because, you know, Jews are always accused of being child sexual abusers. It's the blood Bible. So, anyway. Yeah, as a quinky, quinky queer Jew, I hear you. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and we, and yeah, the idea that the, the, these communities, that we don't represent the communities that were part of our formation is... Uh, it's, it's difficult to understand. Like we were, we are co-led and were co-formed by uh, survivors, sex workers, uh, queer and kinky people. Um, these, you know, fans. Um, all of these communities that supposedly are just a mask for our hidden pro-pedophile agenda. Um, like they are us. Like we are them. You know. Um, so, uh, like, uh, in fact, you know, we don't have maps on our uh, staff or, or board or advisors, you know. So the idea that we're actually representing maps is the one group that we're not representing. I think there should be groups to represent maps, but you know what? I think they should be map-led. I think they should, and they, there are groups like that, you know. Before You Act um, uh, is, is one example of an organisation that explicitly exists to preserve um, the rights for maps to you know, access therapy and um, and to do so not with the uh, objective of preventing child sexual abuse, um, uh, but for its own sake, which is not to say that they support child sexual abuse. It's that yes. they want to be treated as human beings first and foremost, and then to leave child sexual abuse prevention as a separate issue. Now, Prostasia Foundation isn't uh, in that same position because we do have child sexual abuse prevention as our main goal. And so we will always only, um, you know, promote 
um, a human rights agenda where it is supportive of a child protection agenda. And what we're really trying to do is to reconcile the two and to point out that, you know, you don't have to, and in fact, you shouldn't um, be complicit in the abuse of human rights of anyone um, just because, uh, let's think of the children. We should be able to find ways of protecting children that don't require um, the infringement of anyone's human rights. Well, and I can't overstate enough, and they don't like it when we say this, but some maps are minors. Some are quite young. Like, they're beginning to understand. And so we have to protect those children, too. Like, lumping them in with this larger boogeyman thing means that we're not protecting those children. There's a whole bunch of children here that need protection. So I guess the the kind of last thing we were going to talk about is how... I guess this particular social media campaign, but I guess, you know, in general, how this kind of stigma and these attacks sort of have affected Prestasia going forward. Um, so, so going forward, I don't know exactly what the impact of these particular attacks will be because, I mean, we've been attacked before and it usually gives us a week or two of trouble, and then we go on our merry way with our mission. Um, I don't see that that'll change this time. We're going to go on with our mission in whatever form we're able to. Um, I definitely like to speak to the human side of what has happened, of like what we've been through. You mentioned the anti-Semitism, the anti-queer sentiments, the just all of it. And so for me, it's been uh, like... It's definitely a little harder to do my job. It's definitely a little harder to envision what happens going forward. Because when you have so many people telling you you're wrong, you're evil, you're awful, you're Jewish, you know, <laughs> like um, it, you know, there were a few days where it was hard to get out of bed and I locked down my account and I just felt really unsafe. And I'm still working on feeling safe again. Like we're, what, a month into this? And I'm still working on feeling safe again. My account is currently locked. Um, so it's hard. It's definitely hard. And it's impossible to not talk about the death threats that we get. That's definitely a thing um, that really, really sucks. But as far as the overall impact for Prestasia, I, like I said, I see us going forward with our mission. Yeah, I, I don't think that it has affected Prestasia in any anything like the way that our attackers hoped it would. Like our Twitter following is as large as it ever was. Uh, we've gotten more donations than before, including a new uh, dub. Someone's come up and offered to double donations up to $25,000. We've had a flood of new memberships uh, and we've been offered um, new consulting work as well as a plenary session at next week's meeting of um, ATSA, the Association for the Treatment of Sexual Abusers, specifically to talk about these kind of issues, about how, um, you know, discourse around this topic is shut down and distorted. And we wouldn't have had that platform, which is a big platform. There's going to be like 1,600 people in the audience. Um, that's that's great, and, and we only got that because of, of this controversy. So in a way, every cloud has a silver lining, and I, I think Prostasia Foundation is definitely going to be going forward uh, just as strong as before. But in saying that, I don't want to, you know, belittle the the personal cost on, you know, you, yourself, Noah, Megan, and and others on our team. Um, it's not the first time that uh, that we've been targeted, and it won't be the last, but, but we're not going away. All right. Well, uh, again, this is Prestasia Conversations, and if you think that what Prestasia is doing is valuable and that these conversations are valuable, I hope you'll consider um, becoming a member and a contributor so that we can continue to do this work and have these conversations. All right. So, Jeremy and Megan, thank you for being here, and that's it for this month. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.